And now it's time for the Everlasting Gospel. Welcome to the Everlasting Gospel today. My name is Gary McDade, and I'm the host for the program. We appreciate your interest in our Bible studies here on the Everlasting Gospel. We're going to be studying a topic today that is a common topic, and yet is a topic about which not a whole lot of investigation is being made. So we'd like to delve into it a little bit under the heading of, what's the harm in it? You know, it's good for us sometimes to ask, is this practice authorized by the scriptures? In fact, it's good for us all the time to do that. The idea of what's the harm in it is, the Bible says, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. That's in Proverbs 22 at verse 3 and Proverbs 27 at verse 12. What's the harm in it? Our subject is instrumental music in Christian worship. And you'll notice that while most people just assume that that's fine, it is the case that we need to ask, what's the harm in it? Because for most people, there's the idea that this is something that's always been around ever since the first century. But actually, in comparison across the centuries, in fact, two millennia now, the introduction of instrumental music in the worship is a more recent development. 500 years is more recent than 2,000 years ago. And so it would be good for us, I think, to evaluate this. Now, we have prepared a helpful card entitled, What's the Harm in It? And we'll be going through that card, elements of that card, in this presentation. So I'd like for you to just notice there's some verbiage on the card I'd like to read, if I might. If you'll look at it with me, if you're on the, the radio, I'll read it for us. It seems most religions today use instrumental music in their worship without ever seeing the harm in it. People everywhere today are subject to the new covenant of Jesus Christ, which indisputably calls for singing in the nine verses which contextually contribute to an understanding of the subject. Recently, my good longtime friend Joe Dukes saw this presentation and he said, you know, there are really 10 verses because Mark chapter 16, verse 26 is one of those verses and he's just right. So there are 10 verses and we've been saying there are nine. But the thing is, there are verses in our New Testament that uniformly call for singing in worship. Now, if we introduce instrumental music, we've introduced a different type of music. There are really only two types of music, instrumental and vocal. And out of the various categories of vocal, there is singing that is specified. We'd like to take a close look today at this subject of, does the New Testament call for instrumental music in Christian worship? To do that, I'd like to just simply review the fact that we have noted in our previous study what the Scripture saith. The Scripture says, Nine times, ten times now with Mark 14, 26, singing uniformly is called for. In the previous study, when we went over this list on our chart, we noted that it never calls for playing. And while there are verses like in the return of the prodigal son, and there are the re reference to harps in heaven or a sound as of harps in heaven, heaven is a spiritual place and doesn't have physical harps, Yet we're talking about the worship today for Christians in which Christians are to be engaged. And by doing that and looking at our New Testament, we find out that uniformly singing is what the New Testament calls for. I made the point a minute ago that Christ has authority throughout the world. He claimed that in the Great Commission, Matthew 28. He has all authority. And so we look to him for what we do in worship. His covenant is really something that all men must submit themselves to in order to find acceptability with God. So in doing that, we looked last week at the chart and we noticed that the scripture calls uniformly for singing. Now in our study today, what we'd like to do is look at another section of our fact card called What's the Harm in It? and look at instrumental music in worship. When asked to consider the evidence from the New Testament for singing without instrumental accompaniment in worship, Five defensive arguments usually emerge. These are what we're calling the five main arguments. Now, these arguments are presented on our fact card. 
and you might like to have a copy of this card, and we'd be glad to send you one. We have it available readily for you in PDF form. So if you would send your request to the church's website, I preach for the Browns Ferry Road Church of Christ in Chattanooga, and the website would be the initials of the church, bfrcoc.org. And there'll be a place there where you can make a comment. Just say, I'd like the fat card on instrumental music, or I like the what's the harm in it card. This is the only offer that we're putting out there, so there won't be any chance for confusion. Just make sure you include your email address so we can send you those PDFs of this card immediately. We won't use your email address for further solicitation. Also, you may want to have a hard copy of this card. We have them printed nicely. If you're watching by way of TV, if you're following the program, you can see the card I have in my hand. It's a durable 4x8 card. And all of the information that we're looking at in these programs is printed concisely right here. I respect the teenage class that helped me produce this card. So if you'd like a physical card, again, you could write to us at our physical address, and that's going to be 159 Browns Ferry Road, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And the zip is 37419. Once I was asked, is there a way to abbreviate Chattanooga? Well, there may be, but anyway, that's the address. Let us know you'd like this card, and we'll send you one complimentary. So I wanted you to know that that card is available, and it's this card from which we are drawing the material as the basis of our study on what's the harm in it, instrumental music in Christian worship. Now, with that out of the way, let's take a look at what we're calling the five main arguments. Now, this is not to say that other arguments could be made. This is to say that these are five main arguments that we've heard over the years. And we'd like to take each one in turn and give a response to them. Let's look at the five arguments. I'll just read through the five and then we'll go through them individually. They are, number one, David used instruments in the Old Testament. Number two, the Bible doesn't say you can't use them in worship. Number three, instruments are an aid to singing. Number four, Revelation mentions instruments in heaven. And number five, instruments are included in the Greek word solo. Now this last one is a more sophisticated argument. The idea is that the Greek word solo includes an instrument. And so we will be denying that. But you see the five main arguments. Let's take each one in turn. The five main arguments answered. Argument number one, David used them in the Old Testament. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we want to ask this question for those who are making this argument. Yes, David used them in the Old Testament. In fact, in 1 Chronicles 23, 5, David tells us that he is the one who produced these instruments. The verse says, moreover, 4,000 were porters and 4,000 praised the Lord with the instruments which I made, said David, to praise the Lord therewith. Again, in 2 Chronicles 7, 6, attention is drawn to the fact that David was the source of those instruments. Why are we saying that? We're saying that because in the law, that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, instruments were not called for or ordained or regulated in the law of Moses, but rather they were invented by David. Now, if the argument is that we may use them today because David used them, it's one of those arguments that states too much. It's saying too much to say that, because that would mean that whatever David did would be authorized in Christian worship today. Well, no, there are two or three things to consider along that line. For example, in 1 Chronicles 15, 27, David wore an ephod. He was of the tribe of Judah, and he was not authorized to wear an ephod. That was priestly clothing designed and designated solely only for the priests, the descendants of Levi. He erred in so doing. All who know the Old Testament will admit that. Also in 2 Samuel 6 at verse 16, David was escorting the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, dancing. And the dancing was so lewd that he and his wife had trouble over that. Now, I want you to know that what David does doesn't authorize the practice. 
So for those who are saying, David used them in the Old Testament. Well, David also had a harem, many wives. Does that authorize that use today since David did it? You see where we're going in answering that argument. No, we can't say because David did it, that would make it okay. Because the case is that God would tolerate a number of things. For example, the people are the ones who wanted a king, not God. That's very clear in 1 Samuel 8, especially in verse 5. In fact, in the book of Hosea chapter 13 and verse 11, God will say, I gave them a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. God was not happy with the kingship idea. He wanted to be king, and he was replaced first by Saul, then David, then Solomon. So there are things that happen in the Old Testament that are not authorized, that man does because they please him and not God. Our Lord Jesus Christ will call attention to this in Matthew chapter 19, when the discussion here is about the matter of divorcing. And he will go all the way back to the law of Moses, not to the practice of Solomon or David, who had multiple wives, but to the law of Moses in Genesis 2. And he will show that it is one man for one woman for life, Genesis 2, 24. From the beginning, it was not so, he will say in regard to their practices over in New Testament times. So I just wanted you to think about that. I think the argument that, well, David used them in the Old Testament is certainly one that is does not allow them to be authorized today. There are a couple of other passages to consider along this line. Galatians 3.10, using these instruments would be, if it's from the old law, would place one under what is called the curse of the law, Galatians 3.10. Now, many people don't know about the curse of the law. You know what the curse of the law was, as stated by Paul in Galatians 3.10? The curse of the law is you have to do the entirety of the law. It cannot be separated or broken down. It's not a menu like you'd have at the restaurant. You don't have to order everything on the menu. You just pick what you like. The Old Testament law is not like that. It is a package deal. It comes as a unit. And if you go back there and try to justify a practice by one thing from the old law, you place yourself under the curse to do everything contained in the law. That's a strong argument that Paul is making in the book of Galatians to show that today we're under the law of Christ, the New Testament, and not under the Old Testament. In fact, in verses like Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews chapter 8, references made to the fact that the old is taken away, that the new may be established. Also, Hebrews 10, 5 talks about that. And then secondly, under this heading, I want you to notice another verse. It's Colossians 2, verse 14. Christians are not under the Old Testament law. You'll notice this passage says, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So very clearly in that verse, you can see the old law is taken away. So then to say that we can use them because David used them in the Old Testament, I think there's another verse that needs to be emphasized here, and that would be Amos 6.5. In Amos 6.1, the Bible says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. And then as one of those elements characteristic of that ease, a lackadaisical attitude, an attitude of indifference toward the errors of mankind, in verse 5, Amos said, that chant to the sound of the vial, a musical instrument, and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. So this passage is letting us know the argument that we can use instruments in worship today because David used them is not a valid argument. We have shown the refutation of that. So that's the first argument that we have now countered or answered. Also, the second argument is the Bible doesn't say you can't use instruments. Now, let me say just uh, for a minute here as we begin to answer this argument. Beginning with the Protestant Re Reformation in the 1500s under the leadership of Martin Luther, you'll notice that the idea of modern Protestantism is we may do whatever the Bible does not specifically condemn. Now, in that way, you don't have to have authorization for what you're doing. You have to have cancellation for what you might want to do. 
You can't argue from the standpoint of saying we can do whatever the Bible doesn't specifically condemn. That is not the way the Bible teaches. The Bible authorizes with affirmative statements and examples. And the Bible authorizes by implying important principles. That is the way God authorizes practices and actions today. Not by saying what you can't do. Can you imagine if people were going to use instruments of music, which ones are we going to use? It's an unregulated practice in the Old and New Testament. You can't use this instrument. You can't use a clarinet. You can't use a horn. You can't use a harp. Well, imagine the task that God would have set before him to eliminate all the things he didn't want. No, when he identified singing as the form of worship authorized under the New Testament, that is in spirit and in truth, it eliminated other actions of the musical nature that would be taking place in the authorized worship. So I just want you to notice that from the beginning, Protestant Reformation and today Protestant churches, they're not known as that so much today as they're known as denominational churches or even inter- or intra-denominational churches, you'll notice that their principle is the Bible doesn't say we can't. That makes God obligated to answer every whim and desire of man to show what he can and cannot do. The Bible doesn't teach that way. So let's look at this argument a little bit more closely by looking at a couple of passages. The first one will be Colossians 3 at verse 17. Here the Bible says, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We're to do everything in the name of Christ? He doesn't mean to say that we utter the name of Christ over actions that we take. What he means to say is everything we do must be authorized by Christ. As in the book of Acts, when people are being baptized in the name of the Lord, they're being baptized based upon the authority of Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. To do everything in the name of Christ is to do it by his authority. Another way to look at that is stated in 1 Peter 4.11, where Peter says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, or as the Bible. So you see there, there's that principle we were talking about. God's statements exclude other actions and activities. If we're speaking as the oracles of God, we have a passage we can go to. We've gone to 9, and our friend Joe Dukes has pointed out, you can go to 10, because Mark's Chapter 14, verse 26 is one of those. And you can show what the New Testament calls for in regard to the music of the church. You know what it is? Singing. That is what Christ has authorized. And in that way, we can say we are speaking as the oracles of God. So that should answer the idea that the New Testament doesn't say we can't use it. Let's go to our chart again and look at another of these arguments. The arguments that Instruments are an aid to singing. They aid in the singing. However, I want you to notice first off, Romans chapter 14, verse 23. In this verse of Scripture, we learn that whatsoever is not of, of faith is sin. See this? And he that, doubteth is damned if, he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What does that mean? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Ladies and gentlemen, if it's not coming from the Word of God, it is sin. The Word of God didn't authorize it. It is sin to, sinful to practice that. Also in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, here Paul is regulating nine miraculous spiritual gifts that the Christians were given in the infancy stage of the church, the immature stage in the church, while the Word of God was in its development or writing. And in verse 7 he says, Even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Notice, instruments of music, and he mentions pipe or harp, are without life-giving sound. Therefore, they cannot be used as an aid in the spiritual worship of God today. Romans 12, verse 1. They are out of place. Another of the passages is skipping down to verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. 
The use of instruments in the worship are not an aid, for they do not aid in the understanding of the words being communicated among the worshipers. As I said a minute ago, there are two types of music, instrumental and vocal. Vocal music is called for, but not just any vocal music, singing. Instrumental music is eliminated, therefore it cannot be an aid. It is to introduce a different type of music into the worship that, as we've shown, is unauthorized. Now, there's a passage of Scripture I don't want us to forget. It's very important in all things, and that's going to be one of the last sentiments of Scripture, Revelation 28, 18 through 19. Sometimes we summarize this by saying, these are the verses that say you can't add to or take away from the Bible. John said, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So here in the very closing words of the Bible, we're neither to add to nor take away from this book of prophecy. That principle applies throughout the Bible, Deuteronomy 4.2, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6. So there's that second uh, argument, that is the third argument that's being mentioned. Now let's move on down the list. Revelation mentions instruments in heaven. Now we hear about this sometimes, that it's okay to use instruments because in Revelation 14, it mentions the sound of harpers. Notice it's the sound of of harpers that is mentioned, not a literal harp. I want you to observe that there are things in heaven that are not authorized on earth. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But in Matthew chapter 22, the question is being asked on a different subject. The question is being asked about marriage. Are people still married once they get to heaven? The disciples wanted to know about that, and our Lord answers that in Matthew chapter 22 in verse 30, and you'll notice what he says about it. In Matthew twenty-two thirty, Jesus answered them and said, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So there are things in heaven that are not authorized on earth. If Revelation did teach the use of instrumental music, it would teach it in heaven and not here on earth. I don't believe that it teaches it. But if it did, it would not be authorized in Christian worship. Heaven and our place there comes after the judgment. And then there's another point I'd like you to consider on this. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, to me this makes the point really strongly. Paul knew a man above 14 years ago who was taken up to the third heaven, he discusses it. And this is down in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, the person about whom he speaks, we could say that it was the Apostle Paul. I'll offer that to you as, I think, a reasonable conclusion as to whom he was referencing. However, notice He was taken into the third heaven, that's the presence of God, and he heard things there that were unlawful to be uttered here. God wants things revealed. He doesn't reveal everything, but the things that he has revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law, Deuteronomy 12, verse 29. So if there are things that are uttered in heaven that are not lawful to utter here on earth, How say some that since they think they found instruments of music in heaven, they were authorized to use them here on earth? We have to be authorized for what we do in worship, and the use of instruments is not authorized. Let's look at number next. Here, this is the fifth one, and I stated this is a more sophisticated one because it goes to the Greek language for its argumentation. It says instruments are included in the Greek word solo. Now, the Greek word solo appears several times where we have the discussion, especially and primarily in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Let me give you those verses. Ephesians 5.19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. 
Now, making melody translates the Greek word solo. And some say, well, that word solo includes the idea of an instrument. Therefore, we may include, like the Amplified Bible does in brackets, with instruments in Ephesians 5.19. No, not so. To do so is an addition. Now, what I need to do is show you a verse of Scripture that lets us all see that a psalm is the words, whether written, spoken, or memorized. And then that is pl- the music that is played is in addition to that song that is written. To do that, I would invite your attention to the Psalms, Psalm 81, verse 2. I think this will quite adequately demonstrate what we're talking about. We'll go to the Psalms for a discussion of this. We're talking about the word solo, and so it's fitting to do that. Psalm 81, 2. The psalmist says, Take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp, with the psaltery. Now, quite understandably and admittedly, there are instruments in the Psalms, especially Psalm 150, a variety of instruments. But here in this passage, the psalm itself is distinct from the timbrel, the harp, etc. So a psalm may be played, it may be played and sung, or it may only be sung. What do we have in our New Testament? We've made the examination, and it is seeing. And especially in the verse we're looking at now, Ephesians 5.19, psalms are to be sung, not sung and played. So with that, we have taken notice of five main arguments on instrumental music in worship. We have seen how some argue that David used instruments in the Old Testament. You better watch out if your preacher's making that argument. He may have a woman on the side. That sounds funny, doesn't it? Like I'm making a joke. If David's instruments are authorized in worship today because David used them and he had multiple wives, don't be surprised if your preacher says, I can have multiple wives because David did. That is an insufficient basis that is ruled out because David was not authorized to introduce those instruments. A second argument that we're calling a main argument is the Bible doesn't say you can't use them in worship. We must look for what the Bible does say and do only that which is authorized, Colossians 3, 17. Also, we've noticed that instruments are an aid to singing, as was argued. If they are not of faith, they are sin, Romans 14, 23. The fourth argument we answered was Revelation mentions instruments in heaven, And we noted how that there are actually some things in heaven that are not the practice here on earth. Matthew 22, 30. And then also we noted that from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. That doesn't make them authorized here if they are used in heaven, and we don't think they are. And fifthly, instruments are included in the Greek word solo. We saw that they are not. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate your attention to this very important study, and I've been glad to show what the harm in it is, and I hope that you will see it too. Please return as we'll continue our study on this topic, and until we meet again, may God bless and keep you.